Tonight, uh, we also have the prospect of celebrating the 80th anniversary of John Maynard Keynes' lectures at the New School. And these lectures uh, did not take place in this auditorium, but uh, they were widely reported in the press, but they have received very little analysis. Now, uh, the main event tonight is uh, Lord John Eatwell's speech on economic theory in the current crisis, but we have uh, a special introductory uh, remarks by Edward Nell, who has gone back and done some research and analysis of precisely Keynes's 1931 lectures at the New School. Edward Nell is the Malcolm Smith Professor of Economics. He's been the backbone of Keynesian thinking at the New School for decades. He assures me he was not present at Keynes's 1931 <laughs> lecture. And I'm very pleased to have ask Ed to come and deliver some remarks. Well, it's a great pleasure to talk about Keynes, a member of the House of Lords, a Cambridge person all his life, um, as a way of introducing John Eatwell, also Cambridge and also a member of the House of Lords. Keynes came here and lectured, gave two lectures in June 1931. The subject can be indicated by a quote from Keynes, the subject he was supposed to talk about. If we reach a new equilibrium by lowering the level of salaries and wages, we increase proportionately the burden of monetary indebtedness. In doing this, we should be striking at the sanctity of contract. For the burden of monetary indebtedness in the world is already so heavy that any material addition would make it unbearable. The first of his lectures on June 15th, the second was three days later on June 18th. Both were supposed to be about prices. The first was entitled, Do We Want Prices to Rise? The second, What Can We Do to Make Prices Rise? In note show at the time, he was concerned to argue against the view that recovery would come if prices fell far enough, for the reasons the quote indicates. But in fact, both published reports in his own notes indicate that he chiefly directed his attention in these lectures to quite other matters. At the time, he was wrestling with two different but related problems. One concerned policy issues, the other theory. The first was to formulate a set of policy responses that might help to stave off a further decline, especially given the deteriorating world financial system, and to get the economies of the world back onto a path of recovery. He felt that interest rates could and should be lo lowered further, and that bank lending could also be increased. But he felt that in the UK, this could not be done adequately because lowering interest rates would call the bank of, cause the Bank of England to lose gold. Therefore, recovery in the UK could not depend on interest rates and monetary policy alone. It would have to be supplemented or maybe even replaced by a program of public works. Construction, infrastructure, would provide employment and would result in useful roads and buildings. It could be expected to stimulate housing. But Keynes was cautious about advocating this, even for the UK. This brought up the second problem, theory. It has always been relatively easy to provide a common sense case for public works, but we do forget how hard it was to advocate such programs on solid grounds of economic theory. To the contrary, the respectable economic theories of the day, like conservative economics today, held that deficit spending and public works were doomed to failure. Expansion due to intervention would set up offsetting or countervailing forces that would, uh, would undo whatever stimulus the program created. Keynes was wrestling with these issues in the spring of 1931 and the two issues came together on his trip to the US. When he embarked for America, he felt that a program of public works was not necessary and perhaps not desirable for America. He was worried that it might be desirable for the United Kingdom, but he wasn't even too sure there. 
The U.S. economy was more insulated from the rest of the world and could more easily carry out an extremely easy money policy. He tended to think that recovery might well begin in the U.S. But after talking with Federal Reserve officials and others, he changed his mind. Quote, before I went to the United States, I was disposed to hold with some confidence that the first impulses to recovery in the rest of the world would have to come from America. I held this view so firmly that it was some time before I even questioned it. But eventually it was put to me point blank in discussion that perhaps the opposite was true. And in the end, I came to think maybe this is the more probable view. The U.S. was in much deeper straits than he had thought, and it needed more than monetary easing. It needed a public works program financed by borrowing. He had already mentioned this in the treatise when discussing the British slump of the midnight 1890s, where cheap money had little, if any, impact. He wrote, it may have been a case where nothing but strenuous measures on the part of the government could have been successful. This is the British in the 1890s. Borrowing by the government and other public bodies to finance large programs of work on public utilities and government guarantees to support trade and exports were probably the only ways of absorbing the current savings and so averting the heavy unemployment of 1892 through 5. But this is deficit spending as a last resort. The first question then is, does the treatise provide any theoretical justification for this sort of policy intervention? But if it does, why should it be a last resort? The problem for Keynes was therefore to work out and clarify exactly what the argument of the treatise implied about why the world's economies were still stuck in depression. And this involved him in debates with many leading economists. But for Keynes, for, but for Keynes perhaps the most serious were those with his former student and colleague, Dennis Robertson. Keynes was involved at this time in writing a reply to Robertson, published in the September 1931 issue of the Economic Journal, <coughs> in which he argues against Mr. Robertson's view that the price levels of consumption goods and investment goods will move in opposite directions, like buckets in a well. Keynes argued that they would move together rather than inversely. And he developed a number of different ways to demonstrate the point. This is a highly technical debate involving Keynes' notions of bearishness and the propensity to hoard in relation to the prices of non-liquid assets. Not something to get into here. But the significance of the issue can perhaps be made clear in a relatively simple way. If Robertson were correct, that the prices of investment goods and consumer goods moved inversely, then if, for example, public works were to drive up the prices of investment goods, prices of consumer goods would fall as a result of a lot of complicated interactions involving the banks and the propensity to hoard. So profits would decline in the consumer sector and cutbacks there would follow, offsetting any benefits from the public works. In the same way, if welfare and public employment stimulated spending enough, it stimulated enough consumer spending to push up consumer goods prices, the effect would be to drive investment prices down, lowering profits in the investment sector, leading to cutbacks that would undermine the benefits of the original public works. So this is a dangerous argument. And to settle this argument, the treatise, unfortunately, allowed that argument to be made. By contrast, Keynes came to argue that expansion in prices and output in either sector would tend to <laughs> stimulate expansion in the other. He planned to give a set of lectures in Cambridge in the fall of Michaelmas term and had already prepared notes, but had to postpone the lectures until the Easter term of 1932. But these lectures were already developed by the fall. The first lecture was largely concerned with methodology and the logic of inquiry, but the second immediately got into the serious issues in understanding how the economy worked. The argument is technical. We need not be concerned with its details. It led to a famous manifesto by Joan Robinson and Richard Kahn and others. But the important point is that it reached the conclusion, quote, 
we are left with the remarkable generalization that in all ordinary circumstances, the volume of employment depends on the amount of investment, and that anything which increases or decreases the latter will increase or decrease the former. If public works increase prices and output in the investment sector, this will lead to a general increase in output. On this basis, Keynes could legitimately argue that economic theory supported deficit spending on public works. The suggestion here is that Keynes had already reached this conclusion or was in the process of reaching it in the early summer of 1931. In answer to a question about war as a solution to depression, Mr. Keynes declared, there is nothing President Hoover can do that an earthquake could not do better. Oh. <laughs>